Uh, our program includes uh, a talk by Dr. Salti, and then, you know, we have a period for questions and answers, and also if anyone has any comments before uh, closing the meeting. So, uh, I wish in fact to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Ramzi Salti, who is uh, a lecturer uh, at Stanford University in the USA, and uh, you have uh, seen his uh, uh, biography in our invitation, and I will not, uh, you know, take his time by, in fact, repeating what you have already uh, read in the uh, invitation which was uh, sent to you. Uh, we welcome Dr. Salti, we thank him for accepting our invitation, and it's really uh, a pleasure to have him uh, with us. Dr. Salti's uh, lecture is under the title Identity, Representation, and the Creation of an Alternative Discourse in the Poetry of Shouda Haida. So we are all here, Dr. Uh, Ramsey, the floor, the virtual floor is yours. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to share the, the PowerPoint with you today to celebrate the 115th anniversary uh, of uh, Jaudat Haidar. Now, if we want to be precise, I think uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Shahina Osairan knows it, it was actually supposed to be on the 23rd of, uh, of April. We delayed it, but it, it's still a commemoration and it's still an, an, an anniversary. Uh, one week late and uh, I chose this title for my uh, talk today because I'd like it to be sort of a discussion and uh, and and I'd like to uh, attempt to use some of the poetry that I've read and that has helped me through very difficult times to apply to the times we are going through now and to show how poetry can still be very therapeutic and can be applied today so well that some of the poems feel prophetic as if the late poet knew what was going to happen to the world. And I wanted to, uh, to begin by uh, talking about the beautiful relationship that was born earlier this uh, earlier last year before the pandemic hit. It was a, uh, through a, an event we had at Stanford where we celebrated the poetry of Shaudat Haidar. This event was monumental in my life and in my career because it enabled me to meet so many people from LAU who came to Stanford. You can see some of their beautiful faces, I think, in the PowerPoint. Uh, we had students, we had a, we had a full house and uh, and one of the things I wanted to note right away was the fact that a lot of Americans maybe had not heard of Zodat Haidar, had not heard of the poetry. And by the end of the evening, people were rushing to get the DVD and to see where they could get the books. People were starting to quote him. And, and that to me was proof of how universal he is in terms of his uh, poetry and how quickly he was able to reach through his poetry audience an audience that was very diverse we had many people from the LAU we had people from uh, Stanford but then we had the regular Stanford students who maybe don't even know where Lebanon is and yet were able through the poetry to uh, uh, to, to feel uh, some of the feelings that the poet was expressing in terms of his homeland and in terms of living in the West uh, the, the uh, we've got highlights from the events on YouTube if you'd like to see those at your convenience and also I do I don't want to embarrass her but I had the honor of interviewing um, Mrs. Shahina Hosseiran, the poet's daughter, and I think that was one of the most pleasant interviews that I've ever recorded. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but I have a radio show here in California. It's called Arabology, and the, the, the aim of the program
program is to educate people in, in the US about our culture, our music, and of course our poetry. So that interview, I think, uh, helped a lot of people discover uh, the poetry. So in terms of the biography, it, um, I think everybody knows pretty much uh, about his life, but I picked a few little quotes here to uh, to talk about uh, Zaudat Haider. So basically, I think we all know that he was uh, uh, born on the 23rd of April, 1905. And we, when he passed away, he was 101 years old. Allah uh, And And throughout that career, he has worked as an educator. He has worked as a farmer. He has changed hats so many times. And I think that that informs his writing and points to how flexible and how open he was to life and to experiencing different professions. Uh, they say in America, you change career four times in your life. I think he uh, uh, he more than made the quota. Uh, I also wanted to say that in many ways, uh, his poetry was uh, instrumental in uh, reviving the literary scene in Lebanon after the Civil War, and he's the he was the founder and president of Wahat al Adab in, in uh, the Bihar Valley, and a member of the Union of uh, Lebanese Writers. Uh, you know, he's just such a part of Lebanon, whether he was in Lebanon physically or not. And I think that uh, uh, much of his writing is informed by this feeling of alienation and yet belonging. It's it's a very paradoxical feeling, and I think it's reflected in the language. Uh, in doing my research and in reading about what people say about Javdat Haidar, I came up with this term, or I, I found this term that really, I think, in two words reflects the kind of uh, writing uh, that he uses. It's, uh, it's called linguistic exile. A linguistic exile. I mean, we have to keep in mind that uh, Zawda Taida wrote mostly in English, though we're going to see today that he also wrote in Arabic, and we're going to sample some of that poetry. But really, the the, uh, the the language is is in English, but it is the language of somebody who uh, is deeply rooted in his origin as an Arab Eastern man who feels the hardships of his nation and suffers with it deep inside. This is actually a quote you can see at the second quote on the screen and uh, and that is the poet himself saying that so uh, we could have a whole debate I think or a whole talk about you know poets and writers who write in English uh, Zubran maybe being one a, a good example but there is, and I'm gonna get into this just a little bit the fact that you can write in English but write in a way that is so understandable by us Arabic readers uh, that you feel that the poem is almost uh, translatable very easily and I'm going to give you a, a, an example of that uh, I think I heard that uh, uh, Dr. Sahar Hamoude is here today I I Yes, I am. I, yes, I, I'm, I'm going to quote you. I'm going to quote you, Dr. Hamoude, uh, because I, in, in my research, I found this wonderful <laughs> phrase that you published. Uh, his early sufferings, as well as those he encountered as an older man, like the French mandate, the civil war in Lebanon, the deaths of his wife, son and brother, and all that was happening in the Arab world molded what would become his philosophy of peace and universal love. And I think this is at the heart of uh, Jaudat uh, Haidar's oeuvre is the fact that these hardships and uh, and these difficult situations that he found himself in did not turn him into a pessimist in fact he found a way to turn this these difficult situations into empowering optimistic and uh, a, 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 and a new voice that really I think expresses optimism no matter when you read it this is why I think so that 
with our poetry gives us so much hope at times like these and is so relevant today. Um, I, I, I would like to just uh, read a little bit of this poem, which I think all of you and all of us today uh, will relate to. And uh, because this, it, it points to the universal themes that uh, Jaudat Haidar wrote about. Uh, as you know from the title of my presentation, I'm going to be talking about those universal themes, and then I'm going to be zooming in on uh, certain themes that are maybe more centered uh, on Lebanon. Uh, but if you read a poem like this, if you take a, a look at a poem like this to a friend, it doesn't matter whether that friend is Lebanese, Arab, Western, American, uh, you know, it, it just has a universal quality to it. And uh, because I think in the year of pandemics, we've all come to appreciate what good friend, who, what a good friend is. Let me just quote a little bit from this and dedicate it to all of you who I hope are my new friends. Uh, to a friend, why look far away into the no end when you can't view a hill beyond your sight? Better look within your limits, my friend, to distinguish the black from the white. So right away with the opening, I think we get uh, the feeling and, and, and it ends the way it begins with, so why look away? into the no end when you're still featherless should you pretend and i did read this uh, poem at stanford uh last march before the pandemic hit the next day the, the university closed down uh and and to this day i get emails that tell me do you remember that last stanford event you did where you read this poem about friendship who, you know, where can we find that? And so I thought I would begin with that today in terms of the universality of the themes that Jodat Haidar uh, broached. Um, uh, views regarding, or his views regarding nature and the environment. I mean, this is such a multi-talented poet. Uh, you could read some of this poetry and think that it applies to what's going on with all of us today. Uh, let me give you an example here. Have you seen, uh, I don't know if everybody has read this uh, poem, Never Scratch Nature to Bleed and React. From the very title, it feels to me like it has been written about what we've been doing in terms of the environment and nature and how the pandemic by locking us in has led, ironically, to uh, a better environment because less people are driving, the, the lockdown has... A... And so even the very first line in this poem, we chariot to school to learn to read and write, not to skin nature and rise to the sky, not to work for fame by using dynamite, pollute the world and by pollution die. Where this poem was written decades ago, and this poem applies not only to the environmental mess in which we find ourselves in, Allah in Kun Bilubnan, you're feeling it extra hard, but we're feeling it all over the world. And it's this idea that when you mess with nature and you mess with the balance, we are suffering the consequences. And uh, I think it can be summed up in one line. Never scratch nature to bleed and react because nature will react. And what is the pandemic but a reaction to what we have been doing? Uh, it, I can't get over the fact that this poem, for example, was written way before we went through anything this year and it became relevant again. It was as if it was written yesterday. Um, I'm gonna move to the next slide here. Uh, women, uh, when, I, I, when I say that he's multi-talented and interested in so many social issues, that includes women's rights. I mean, if we were, if we are to contextualize this poem decades ago when he wrote it, this was considered pretty controversial. Now, alhamdulillah, we're broaching these themes. We're talking about women's rights. There's still a long way to go, perhaps, but we have improved. 
this is this was written before an acknowledgement of women as equal to men. And in fact, I think Haidar was far ahead of his time in his recognition of the equal rights of men and women everywhere, everywhere. Uh, so if you look at this poem about women here uh, and, and the fact that he's looking at men and women as a team, as working together, as extending uh, their uh, arms towards each other, a team who can save the world from ugliness, from pollution, and, and, and a team with equal partners. Uh, I, I came across an Arabic translation of this poem about women that you can see. And it was uh, translated by Amal Debo in 2010. And, uh, the poem was written in English, but I wanted you to see how easily translatable it is, how, how, how easily it lends itself to an Arabic translation to where when you read the Arabic translation, it feels like it was written in Arabic. Um, we say, you know, in Arabic, uh, there is something that is, you know, mutarjam, and then there's something that's mu'arrab. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, the way he writes in English even though it's in English, ha retains so much of the Arabic language in it. And, uh, and, uh, and the case in point is looking at a translation. It, 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 uh, it's the same for perhaps the Bronze Prophet, which was of course written in English, and everybody assumes today it was written in Arabic because the translation or the, the uh, transference to Arabic uh, was so seamless. So uh, I'm going to read it in, in Arabic. بالنسبة للنساء عضل القلب هن خير دليل على درب نضالنا معا تشابكت أيدينا نعمل لديمقراطية نحلم بها لأرض سلام وحب وحرية this doesn't this does not feel authentic and and as if it was written in Arabic taking a look at the English text I think this is one of the qualities you feel you could write in a foreign language and still write your own language with by using a foreign language the ex the expressions come through so seamlessly um, I'm gonna move on to the next screen. And that is Lebanon. No matter where, where he went, and we all know that he lived in many places. He loved Texas, for example, and wrote poems for Texas. Uh, he had such an affinity for the West and, uh, and his own uh, country. But uh, there's nothing like reading uh, these two poems by uh, Jauda Taidar. One is titled Lebanon, and the other is called Beirut. And uh, again, as I read a couple of uh, verses from the poems, uh, I want you to think about the time he wrote this and how relevant and applicable it is today. Uh, for example, from Beirut, uh, from the poem Beirut, which you see on the screen to the right, where's Beirut of yesterday, the city that was keeping big with fate, the precursor of religious pride in the East, where the origins of thought opened the purda of mind to teach the world the true meaning of brotherhood and love. Where is the Beirut of yesterday? Where's Beirut? Where are, where are the universities, the hospitals, the skyscrapers, the banks, the churches, the mosques, the domes, the spires, the prosperous and busy streets? I read this in the context of the horrible tragedy that happened in Lebanon and uh, still as somebody who lives in the West has not been able to process the horror that has happened over there. I see it through news and pictures and images, but I have not been to Lebanon since. And when I when I read this poem, I felt a very sort of bittersweet feeling. I felt uh, nostalgic and I, and I wish I was there, but I also felt a little bit of a lamentation about times that have gone by. Now, certainly there is 
uh, optimism and there is a, a belief in a better future for Beirut, but there's also very painful memories that are evoked here. And I think that the recent tragedy in Beirut can be added to that. Again, he was writing this decades ago, before any of the current developments were happening. Allah Ahmed ibn Beirut. Um, here's, uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to make a comparison ever between Khalil Zubran and Zawdat Haidar. Uh, in fact, I, I, you know, I even was talking with uh, the poet's daughter about this and the fact that they are quite different. However, a lot of people immediately uh, broach the topic of Zubran when we talk about Zawdat Haidar because they have in common the fact that they wrote in English. And as Lebanese poets speak, uh, you know, their work was disseminated in the West and uh, the language was that of the West in a way. Um, but uh, but when he did, uh, I mean, Zawdat Haider himself wrote about Zubran. This was a poem that he wrote titled Zubran, Khalil Zubran. And what I thought was very interesting in the poem, and I only am showing you an excerpt here, is that he imagines in the poem a conversation he's having with Zubran, but but not as two poets speaking to each other, but he, he imagines it as, as in a father-son conversation. He's having a conversation with Zubran as a father-son uh, conversation. Now, when he's when, when when you when you see this dialogue to the right, you know, my boy, what ails you here? Don't you see this paradise of your land? Father, he said, here I have no plow to cultivate the field I own and reap the harvest of my aspirations. So this is all imagined. And it's and it's imagined as a dialogue between a, a father and a son. Two poets that may have experienced the same thing, but are having a conversation in terms of wisdom and what you've gained in terms of wisdom, what you could bestow onto the next generation. Uh, again, here I'm going to uh, emphasize the fact that th that uh, uh, instead of talking with Zubran as even an imaginary conversation, he's actually uh, turned it into very much of a paternal uh, relationship that is happening. And that of course, boy, uh, uh, you know, um, approaches the fact that in so much of his poetry, you don't know if he's reading to you, the reader, to you, this other that he creates. Uh, is he the narrator? Is he, involving us is directly, indirectly. I think this whole concept of the other in poetry in general and in Jaudat Haidar's poetry particularly, uh, I think that deserves a lecture of its own. Uh, here is where I'm going to make the transition from the universal to the personal. And uh, and, and this is, I think, one of the most beautiful poems that I've read. Uh, it was an elegy, and it was written for his son, Bassam, who passed away. And uh, I think we all know the feeling you have where if your child passes away before you do. You feel in some way it's unnatural. It's not what, what, how we've, we're conditioned to look at life. And so he, uh, in, uh, in writing his elegy for his son Bassam, uh, you can see some of the themes that are coming out that are uh, uh, that of a father who has lost his dear son. Uh, but I want to make one quick point after I read just a couple of verses for you. One tear means a universe of despair. So why weep and count the tears in the lake? One would be more than sufficient to bear. Be patient, Pa. Stop weeping for my sake. He goes on to talk about, you know, um, his grandchild. Uh, so, you know, Zodat Sr. Then there's Zodat Jr. 
and Janine and the mother, I mean, in, in the last uh, part. But uh, again, when you look at, at this, be patient, Pa, stop weeping for my sake. The poem doesn't begin with, uh, you know, necessarily uh, his uh, late son speaking, but then it turns into this conversation again, where you're not sure, are you speaking to the reader? Are you talking to your son? It's, a, of, of course, an imaginary conversation, but where, it, who, who is speaking to who and in what space and, it, and in what time? I think, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is so evident in so much of his poetry. Uh, the personal side, when uh, when Jodat Haida writes about his family, I think stands in sharp contrast to the universality that we feel when we read his work uh, uh, in, in general. And this is what I'm leading to. It's very interesting that when his son Bassam passed away, Allah Yirhamu, Jodat Haida decided to write a poem in Arabic to uh, to mourn him. He didn't write in English, and this poem, Wujudila uh, Wujud, you know, I, I was trying to read about the context for that poem, and of course he said it himself. When I heard that my son died, I felt that I the Arabic come out of me. I had to write it in Arabic. So although I've been arguing that his poetry is very Arabicized in some ways, or Arabized in, in many ways, even when he's writing in English. It's very interesting that when it comes to the one of the most profound losses that a human being can experience, he turned to the Arabic language. Um, so the the poems, uh, the poems actually called Wujud ila Wujud and hits on existence and existentialism and so many other themes that can be universal. But in terms of the personal, because he has lost his son in, in a very unexpected way, um, uh, I'm going to uh, to read to you a little part of the poem. Ahen lo alim tu ma biha, la alim tu sir al wujudi wal khulud. Sharit al haya wujud la khulud. Khud min al bahri ibratan wamshi ala durub al haya hakiman fi al wujud. This this poem, uh, which of course exists in uh, Jaudat Haidar Mishwar al Omar, a book that was kindly gifted to me by uh, Mrs. Ausaira by Shaheen Ausairan, uh, with a beautiful dedication, one of my most treasured possessions. Um, uh, it includes so many of the Arabic works and, uh, and what the Arabic press said about them. And that was one of the issues that when we had the event at Stanford, uh, you know, many people were saying, but what about in Arabic? Did he write in Arabic? And when I got this book, Mushwar al-Omar by Jaudat Haidar, I discovered a whole new side because writing in Arabic is, is applied with him more to the personal than it is to the universal. And that may make sense. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, this poem was uh, sung by Abiy al uh, I don't know how many of you have heard the, her interpretation. Um, I'm going to try to play just a part. Uh, Dr. Vahid, please, if there is no audio, would you let me I know? Would, I will let you know. Yes, okay. No, we cannot hear it. Huh? You couldn't hear any audio, Dr. Vahid. No, unfortunately not. Yeah, yeah, I think this this happens on Zoom too. There's a special, like in addition to sharing the screen, you must click some box to share the audio. In any case, everyone, I'm going to make my PowerPoint available to you through Dr. Vahid, who will be, who uh, I'm happy to to disseminate it. Dr. Vahid, please feel free to share it with everybody. Uh, one of, and, and one of the things you can do by sharing it is that I have placed the YouTube uh, links 
right there. So anything uh, today that you'd like to revisit, um, you know, you would just have to click on the uh, YouTube uh, um, link, and there you'd be able to hear Abir Nami reading this poem and singing it. It was actually uh, the melody it was composed by Elina Me and based on the words of uh, uh, the song Wujudila Wujud. But the title of Abir Nami's song is Ya Bahar, or some people just call it Wesh Wish. Wish wish shawati ukarram liya tu ya bahar Wish wish shawati ukarram liya tu ya bahar Kind of concludes. I wanted to conclude with a musical interlude uh, today, but uh, I think uh, I'm going to leave it with this um, uh, in terms of existence and existentialism from a poem called Lines. What's nothingness but a nothing of nothing and the infinite but a limitless space? We are all within the infinite a thing. Uh, shukran for listening to me. I hope I didn't take too much time here. Uh, but I have to tell you that this was one of the most beautiful moments I've had to be with my colleagues in Lebanon through the magic of technology and to be able to relate with each other. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salski, for this very inspiring very comprehensive, very uh, thorough presentation, which in fact raises several points, which uh, you know uh, are extremely important nowadays, as Dr. Salti has pointed out. Talking about you know peace and universal love as uh, being in the heart of Jaudat Haider's poetry, uh, the uh, emphasis on the universal themes. And the uh, poet Jawad Haider is also another issue that uh, we need these days to take into consideration. I like very much personally the idea of uh, writing in a foreign language, but reflecting uh, his original uh, culture or even his original mind. So I mean, somebody who is Lebanese writing in English. So English becomes a, a language which represents, in fact, his native uh, uh, culture, but does not represent, in fact, the culture, let's say, of the Americans or the British or the English-speaking uh, uh, nations, native English-speaking nations. And, of course, uh, the highlight was that poem, which was really very uh, uh, significant, where he says, don't uh, scratch nature because it has. Unfortunately, during the last few decades, humanity has scratched nature a lot. And now nature is uh, taking its revenge. You know, according to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Islamic philosophy, nature and the universe is a living being. It has its own uh, type of life and uh, it feeds, it feeds. We have been very cruel uh, to nature during the past uh, decades. And now, in fact, uh, nature is uh, has been showing us it's cruelty through, you know, a weapon that is invisible. Imagine, you know, that invisible weapon has, in fact, uh, uh, won over all the nuclear uh, forces that exist uh, on this planet. All humanity has uh, shown its weakness uh, in front of this uh, weapon, this natural weapon. So, uh, uh, 
what is made by nature is always much stronger than what is made by uh, factories and by money and by wealth. So uh, I will not talk uh, uh, more than this because, you know, if I start getting into this, then, you know, uh, <laughs> spent because these are very important things that I love to talk about. So I will stop here and I will leave the floor to questions that you like to uh, raise and uh, I'm sure the faculty will be happy to answer your questions. And if you have any comments, uh, any input that you like, in fact, to uh, uh, do also feel free. But of course, I request that uh, your comments are uh, presented uh, briefly because, you know, we have limited time. 